Smart home hubs are one of the most confusing aspects of building a smart home, and yet they can be the key to success. They are often the brain of your smart home, but they are usually a little mystery box. So today's video is intended as a complete guide to understanding what a smart home hub is, what it does, when to use one, the best ways or practices with a hub, and towards the end of the video, I'll give you details on some of the most popular hubs available so you can pick one or a few to put in your home. Hello Automators, thanks for tuning in again. I'm Brian from Automate Your Life and if you are new here and you feel a little confused during today's video, of course you can ask questions in the comments, but you should know that I also did a video called How to Build a Smart Home 101, which is more of a guide to get you started in building a smart home. So if you need to start from the ground up, check the links in the description below for that. I realize this video is long, but the good news is that you can come back to it anytime and pick up where you left off. I've also added time codes below to help you jump around and get the information you need. But let's start with what a smart home hub is. The definition of a smart home hub has changed significantly in the last few years and it will continue to shift. So I'm going to give you a very basic definition and then we will delve deeper into what a hub looks like today. The basic definition of a smart home hub is the brain of your smart home. It's a controller with both processing power and some memory that connects to many smart home products. It allows you to create and run automations and provides a platform or software for other features that helps you organize, maintain, and build a smart home. Most of the smart home hubs that we use are physical devices that look like little white or black boxes. They will be located somewhere in your home and will connect to your home's network through either Wi-Fi or Ethernet. In order to connect to other smart products, it's likely that they will also have radios for other wireless technologies that smart home products use. Those wireless technologies are Wi-Fi, ZigBee, Z-Wave, Thread, LoRa, and Bluetooth. Plus, some hubs contain technologies like infrared receivers or blasters, or even some that emit other radio frequencies. Today, a smart home hub can come in the form of that little white or black box. It can be so small that it's tough to comprehend. It can sit inside of a camera like these ones from Akara, and it can be part of a smart speaker like the ones from Amazon or Google or Apple, and it can even be a piece of software that could run on your phone like an app or on a web server somewhere else in the world like If This Then That. In order to fully grasp why we use hubs, we need to understand what they can do and how they contribute to an overall smart home. The fact is, a smart home only works well if all of our devices can communicate with each other. The devices have to be able to trade signals back and forth to make what we want to happen, happen. Now, our definition of a smart home hub identified two major features that are important for this goal. The first is that hubs have to be able to communicate with many smart home products. There are many different ways for these products to do that, and I just named the technologies that have been developed to assist with this. Each technology has its benefits and its drawbacks, but let's say that we have a smart bulb, and let's say that this product says on the box that it requires a smart home hub. What that means to your smart home is that the smart bulb on its own cannot communicate with the other devices in your home without that smart home hub doing the talking for them. It's kind of like a translator. So what happens is you connect this smart bulb directly to your smart home hub. In most cases, you do that with an app. Then the smart home hub has more powerful features and more ways to communicate with the rest of your smart home. It becomes the gateway from and to your smart bulb for the rest of your home. Since we know your smart home hub will connect through Wi-Fi or Ethernet to your home's network, it's made it one step easier for everything else in your home to communicate with that bulb. Now there's more to it, but the hub can now pass the signals that your smart bulb needs to receive or send out as necessary. 
Those signals going out are either a state of the smart bulb, which would mean it's reporting things like whether it's on or off, uh, the brightness, and maybe the color or color temperature. The signals coming in could be commands from other hubs, apps, and more. This leads us to that second feature that makes up the definition of a smart home hub. That is that we can create and run automations with the hub. This is how you save time and can save money in your life or create convenience and security. So it's really where the rubber hits the road. I'm going to borrow something from our previous How to Build a Smart Home 101 video where I explained the anatomy of an automation. In summary, an automation includes at least one trigger or condition that starts the automation and at least one action that is run. The trigger and action devices don't have the smarts necessary to create and run and manage that automation process. Instead, that brain power sits in the hub. So when we go back to our example of the smart bulb, we need a trigger or a reason that we want that smart bulb to turn on. Let's say that we want the smart bulb to turn on every time we walk into a room. So we have, uh, we also have to connect a motion sensor to our smart home hub. Once we have done that, the smart home hub can communicate to both the bulb and the motion sensor. And when the motion sensor sees movement, it sends a signal to the hub, which it then uses to decide to turn on the smart bulb. Some hubs will give you options for multiple conditions and some hubs will give you multiple actions. Each hub will have different options for what those conditions and actions can be. And there are other differences that I will explain as we go forward in the video. Now you know a bit more about what a smart home hub does with automations, but a good hub allows you to do much more. Scenes are a major feature today as they are a quicker way of turning on or setting smart devices to the exact way you want them to be in a certain situation. A great example of this is when you head downstairs to watch a movie in your theater room, you probably want to set up a movie watching scene. That might dim the lights, turn back lighting on behind a TV, turn on an AV system, a smart streaming stick, and because theater rooms can get a little warm, you might turn on a fan or set your home's thermostat to a lower temperature. There are all kinds of things you can do with a smart home hub within one scene. But this takes us to another feature that is more important, or at least from my perspective, but you won't find it on all smart home hubs. These are called modes, and you can turn these on or off based on what activity you're doing or what situation your home is in. Then that mode can be used as a condition to any other automation running. So when we think about that movie watching scene, then we can really improve that by turning on the movie watching mode in our smart home hub. What I use that for is to ignore certain automations that I don't want to run when the mode has been turned on. A great example of that is if I have a motion sensor in the area that is controlling my lights, then I probably don't want that turning on every time someone shifts a little bit in the room while we're watching a movie. There's a lot more that can be done with hubs, but I think you're getting the gist now. Another feature that may or may not exist on your smart home hubs is an option for home security. I personally think that this is really important to have on at least one smart home hub in your home because it will give you either self-monitored options for home security or connect you with a professional monitoring service for a fee. Smart home hubs that provide this often connect well to some smart security cameras as well as other devices that can protect your home and notify you when an event has occurred. Many hubs and really the apps that they are attached to can connect to other services and then those services can sometimes be used in automations running on the hub. A great example of this is Amazon Echo speakers allowing the starting of music or radio within their routines. Plus a common request is to announce something out of those speakers which is a service attached to the voice assistant. Services like this lead into life automation as much as it does home automation and I think you'll find that this is the future of many hubs or apps that connect with hubs. 
The more complex hubs and platforms have options for scripting automations or coding, this can give you an incredible level of control in determining when and how an automation executes in your home. But that obviously takes another level of skill versus just creating automations in an app. And when smart home hubs get really big and complex, they start to become an ecosystem of their own, sort of like an app store. The larger hubs and apps allow developers to create what is either called a skill or an action or a smart app that can be installed or just enabled within the app and then can run on the hub. This can make the features on your hub endless and based on how many people are interested in developing solutions for that hub. In many cases, companies will create these little apps or little solutions within their hub software and deploy them themselves but you can have both of these sources of features. Probably the biggest question that people have around a smart home hub is, should they actually get one? The question of when to use a smart home hub versus when not to use a smart home hub is pretty complex, but let me try to boil this down to a few reasons for and against having one. Here's the list of reasons why. Please feel free to add your own reason in the comments below so people can read them. Most smart home hubs are going to allow you to do more complex automations that get closer to the reality of your life. You still have to buy the right hub for your situation, but that's a big benefit uh, versus a, a couple of devices in an app. Putting a lot of devices on your home's Wi-Fi system can make your whole smart home fall apart. No matter what router or mesh Wi-Fi system you have, they will hit a limit on the number of devices and will start dropping connections to your gear. And on that note, there are many reasons to use the other wireless technologies that are available on smart home hubs. One of the biggest ones is that they are better suited for certain types of devices or certain situations. For example, Zigbee, Z-Wave, Thread, LoRa, and even BLE, or Bluetooth Low Energy, are all low power use networks. So they are better for battery powered devices like sensors. The lower carrier frequencies used in Z-Wave and LoRa make them better suited around reflective surfaces or in areas of your home where Wi-Fi struggles to stay reliable. If you've ever tried to automate around a fridge, you'll know this. Outside, LoRa can go a quarter of a mile and Z-Wave and Thread can travel a hundred feet on average. Zigbee, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth usually carry less of a distance. And sometimes you're just looking for a product that doesn't exist unless you use a hub. Z-Wave and Zigbee have long histories versus Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in the smart home space, so there are extra options. And when you have found a specific device that you want to use, but it requires a hub, yep, you're stuck. A great example is when you find something unique, like this smart button pusher from SwitchBot. It's a Bluetooth product and it requires their, their hub to be controlled by voice or through automations. And maybe the biggest reason is that smart home hubs aggregate everything in your home, but they also aggregate the smart home industry as vendors don't have to produce connectivity to hundreds of thousands of products available today. That means more companies are able to produce connections to their hub and often means that a hub will connect to just about everything else in your home, either by a cloud connection or a local network connection. And speaking of local network connections, there is definitely a higher percentage of automations and products that you will be able to bring into your home that will work locally with a hub. And therefore, they will not require the internet to be available in your home. Now, each hub has its nuances around this, but this is also a trend we are seeing in the industry towards local connectivity. So there are a lot of reasons to get a smart home hub, but there are some reasons for not needing one. I think the biggest is when you're looking for just a few features. For example, you want lights to turn on at a certain time of day, or you want a doorbell that notifies you when someone's at the door or a package has been dropped off. Those simple use cases don't traditionally need a hub. If you aren't going to be a heavy user of automations and you really just want to add a few interesting features that you can start by voice or start by an app on your phone, 
then you don't need a hub again. A lot of people get into the smart home space by either buying a video doorbell, a smart thermostat, or maybe a smart door lock. Most of those are pretty comprehensive in terms of the features they provide, and you don't often need a hub with them. There are a few features where hubs improve these situations, but for most people, they're just looking for notifications and control from an app, or in the case of a smart thermostat control, automatically uh, decreasing their bill. In general, I think it's pretty clear that smart home hubs give you the chance to build complexity in your automations and it really enables you to grow your smart home. Other solutions that don't include a hub are going to limit you in a lot of ways. Now, with this in mind, let's walk through how your home will be organized with a smart home hub and how it brings those extra layers of features. If you don't organize how your smart home works, then you will end up in a state of chaos or you will just end up feeling less satisfied with what you've done and what you've purchased. So over time, I have built a hierarchy of smart home features or automations and how I organize my home around them. And here are the seven things you should include in your hierarchy. Number one, modes. Number two, scenes. Number three, automations or routines. Number four, a dashboard. Number five, voice control. Number six, button or push buttons or switches. And number seven, apps. Now think of a mode like an activity that you are doing or like a state you want to place your smart home into. I already gave you the example of where you might head down to an entertainment area for movie night and you turn on the TV time mode that can then ignore certain automations like turning on the lights based on movement in the area. But another mode is if you've gone away from your home and you want security notifications. Those two modes won't ever coincide, or at least they shouldn't, but you might have an opportunity for two or more modes to happen at the same time. Most modern hubs won't allow you to have two modes enabled at the same time, in fact, many don't even have a modes feature and you have to get created. Now I will call this a smart home 301 level concept, but I will baseline it for you here so you can start to consider how you might make this happen. If your hub has the feature of multiple conditions within automations, you can make this happen in a roundabout way. Let's imagine we have an automation that we don't want to run when our home is in TV mode. In this case, let's go all the way back to our simple motion sensor automation that turns on a light bulb in the space when motion or movement is detected. If we were able to add on an additional condition that said the home was not in TV time mode, then we could stop this from running. Now, if you consider that you can name a light bulb or a smart plug anything you want, then there is no reason you couldn't use a light bulb sitting in your basement as an indicator for TV time mode being active. You could decide in other automations how to turn that on or off. The other way you can do this is through virtual devices, which some hubs allow you to create. That's an easier way to do it. And if you're familiar with programming, really what you have with virtual devices is a variable that you can then program through your smart home. And finally, because I know a lot of people use Amazon and their voice assistant, they actually do give you a couple of ways to layer your automations. The first is the time frame being a second condition, and the second is the ability to enable and disable automations. I know that this is a fairly complex topic, but I hope this has given you an idea for how to do it in your home. The next layer of automation is a scene. Now, scenes are used to turn on or off multiple devices at once, and or multiple devices can be set to a specific look or feel. It's really just a way to organize your home into consistent situations. I think a great example of this is when you enter into a home office, you may have a different look and feel that you want versus your spouse, and you might even use different equipment. If each of you have a scene created that sets up the space the way you want, then turning that on within other automations or through modes will make it easier to organize your automations. Now, really, 
There is no reason. You can't just put all of the different actions you want to have happen in a scene in an automation. So scenes are truly not necessary. They just help things look cleaner and make it easier for you to understand how and why something is happening when you have to troubleshoot in the future. And that brings me to routines or automations, which is the next layer of how you build out your smart home. Routines and automations as a term are really the same thing. And what is happening is that a trigger event or a number of conditions have caused an action or a number of actions to occur. In all cases, the actions will happen sequentially because that's how computers and processing works today. So the order of an automation can actually matter to what you experience. This is even the case when it appears to be happening all at the same time. The options that you will have for starting a routine or automation is based on a number of factors. Number one, the hub you have. Number two, the location where you live or where your account is based out of. Number three, the devices you have in your home, including uh, one device having different options than another device of the same type. So these two motion sensors can have different options even though they're really the same device. The services and apps, skills, or features you've enabled on your hub and the other hubs or systems you've connected to your hub. The same factors really determine the type of actions you have access to in your automations. However, you may have some additional conditions or additional ways to augment those conditions. For example, when I use uh, Samsung Smart Things with a smart light bulb, I can check the dimming level of that smart bulb as part of my conditions. However, smart things gives us the option to say it's exactly a certain percentage brightness, or we can choose equal or above a certain percentage brightness or equal or below a certain percentage. On the action side, you might have more options too, depending on your hub. You might have an option to delay for a few seconds or even hours, or you might be able to automatically turn off a device after it has been on for a set period of time. There are also toggle type actions in certain hubs. So if it's on, it goes off. If it's off, it goes on. Additionally, and maybe the biggest difference you will find between hubs is what features you get from the app of the original smart device. So a great example of this comes from Govi Lighting. Their lighting is Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, and when it is Wi-Fi, you can usually connect it to Amazon and Google Voice Assistants. Those kind of act as your hub. When we get into routines, Govi with Amazon has a ton of features. Whereas when you look at Google's routines, it's much harder to use Govi's scenes, and in some cases, you can't even make certain features happen. So modes, scenes, routines, and automations control your home in these automatic ways that you don't really have to think about. That's nice, but the problem is, what if you want to bypass those automatic ways your home is controlled? This is where some more instant forms of control comes in handy. They're the one-off control, but they have their own reasons for existing. The next layer of organizing your smart home is a dashboard. And with some hubs, you'll get a dashboard that you can't really customize. The best example of that is Amazon or Google smart displays, or even on an iPad or iPhone with the Apple Home app. However, the more complex hubs give you access to more sophisticated options for creating a dashboard, and there are even third-party dashboard creation tools that can really help you take your dashboard to that next level. Usually with these tools, you can then drop them onto any tablet and then place them around your home for control. There are a lot of videos available today that will show you how to get started with this, but truly, Creating a smart home dashboard is a bit of an art form and having created these kinds of interfaces in industrial facilities, I can tell you that most of the tools available today make smart home dashboards an okay method for controlling your home. Where I find they fall down is in how complex they end up in a large smart home. So it's best to make dashboards that fit one specific area in your home and then put a tablet there. The next way people control their smart homes, and I think ends up in a layer below a smart home dashboard, is through voice control. 
The nice thing about voice control is that it can bypass your modes and automations and it will let you control those one-off situations. It's also nice because you can start uh, scenes and when you tie a voice assistant to another smart home hub, then what you gain is access to turn on and off those modes if you have organized things correctly. The truth is the voice assistants also contain routines or automation options, but they are usually a lot simpler than a full smart home hub and you can trigger those routines by voice. The other important thing about voice assistants is that your smart home hub will likely be able to integrate with them. But the thing to keep in mind is that your hub will feed information to the voice assistant and you will not have much information travel back to the hub. What I mean by this is that devices you bring into your hub will show up and be controllable in the voice assistant application and then obviously be capable to run by voice. What you will experience if you integrate a product directly with the voice assistant is that it won't show up in your list of devices on your hub. Now there are workarounds like the virtual switches or devices I just spoke about that would allow you control both up and down from the voice assistant, but it has to be done thoughtfully. So while those voice assistant apps are the top level app or hub in your home, you can usually find ways around it. Because they are a simpler device, push buttons or even switches are the next layer down from voice assistants. This doesn't make them any less useful and in fact, I think in a lot of cases, these can be some of the most useful devices in a smart home. They're just simpler. There are buttons and switches that give you a lot of options for integrating with different hubs and with different smart home platforms. So they can do a lot. And the really nice thing about these kinds of devices is they can sit anywhere in your home. Brian is a magician and so are you. So they can be anything from a relocation of a light switch or a duplication of a light switch all the way to in the case of something like buttons from flick starting multiple routines, multiple automations or scenes in multiple hubs. That means these can be a great way to start anything in your smart home, but they are that physical interaction device. And finally, the apps themselves that vendors create or that your smart home hub has, they become a way that you can control your smart home. This might be more convenient than creating automations for push buttons or creating a smart home dashboard or using the voice assistant, but you usually have very little control over the way that an app is laid out. And then you do have to live with that phone or tablet around you and then find the app. I think the better part of apps are widgets that give you specific control that you use on a regular basis around your home. It gives you a little button on the home page or on the screen of your phone, you can just press that. The question of whether or not you can use multiple hubs is simple to answer, but the impacts of that answer are complicated. So the short answer is yes. You can use multiple hubs and you can also use multiple smart speakers from multiple companies and you can place them all over your home with different tasks or different parts of your life in mind. Now let's start with why you might choose to have multiple smart home hubs. There are great examples of specialized smart home hubs that work only with a subset of device types. What I mean is that when you look at uh, the Lutron Cassetta system, it's really about controlling smart lights and blinds and shades in your home, but it doesn't do anything else. Those products require the Lutron hub and they actually use a 433 megahertz carrier frequency uh, to go between the hub and the products. That means there is no other hub you could use to connect to their light switches and fan controllers. So you are stuck. There are many other examples of this today, including a Cara, Philips Hue, Tuya, Wise, and I'm sure many more that I'm forgetting. These are what I would call secondary hubs that allow you to automate with those products only. All of them have some ability to create automations in their app, but in general, you are only going to be able to automate with the products that that company produces within their app. So what happens in these hubs 
often sits in a lower layer than your main hub or your main controller app. You basically end up feeding devices and potentially some scenes to your overall hubs app. And then you have that overall or main uh, hub control it through all of its features. Now there are drawbacks to doing this because sometimes you lose features when you choose the wrong main hub. And a really great example of this is that SwitchBot doesn't have an amazing integration with SmartThings. You can't use all of the features in the SmartThings app that you can in the SwitchBot app. So this is again a point of stopping and researching how that integration goes and how it works. The other thing to consider when you use multiple smart home hubs like this is that each one of those integrations between hubs tends to be cloud-based. So let's go back to our example of the motion sensor and the smart bulb connected to our smart home hub. Let's say that our hub is capable of connecting the motion sensor to the hub directly, and in this case, locally. That means that any automation using that motion sensor would be quick and very reliable. It wouldn't require the internet to report back that it sees motion. In our previous version of this example, we said the bulb was connected to our hub as well. If this was the case, then all of the communication happens between the bulb and the hub and the motion sensor and the hub. However, let's pretend for a moment that we bought a smart bulb that doesn't directly connect to our existing hub. Now, in order for the motion sensor to turn on the bulb, the two hubs have to communicate. Now there are a few ways for this to happen and depending on the two hubs that we were talking about, this might work differently. What I mean by this is that the communication could be in two directions, which would mean the status of the motion sensor and the status of the smart bulb would be available on both hubs. The communication could be in a single direction though which would mean that the status of the smart bulb would have to be sent to our first hub, but that the status of the motion sensor would not be available on our second or our newer hub. Either way, that information has to be passed and an automation has to be created on one of the hubs to make sure that the smart bulb turns on when the motion sensor sees motion. Unfortunately today, in a lot of cases, the hubs don't communicate directly together. This could change in the future and I think we will see that take place. But often what happens is that each hub aggregates its data and then sends it to their respective cloud services. Then when something changes, that's added to the information in the cloud service. Then each hub that has been allowed to pull data from that cloud service will see that change and then it can react. The other thing that has to happen in this case is that the cloud services have to exchange the information that hub one wants hub two to change the status of the smart bulb. So what happens in this example is that the motion sensor sees motion and then sends that locally to the first hub. That's very quick. That hub recognizes that an automation has been created and that in order for the automation to work, they have to send the command to the cloud service for the second hub. That sending of the command obviously requires the internet to be available and that signal has to travel across some part of the world. There are time delays and there are reliability losses with that. Now that sounds pretty complicated and what will be even funnier to you is that then the status of the smart bulb is sent back along that path through the cloud services and over to your first smart home hub. That's a ton of communication and a ton of distance that your signals could travel, which again introduces a lot of time delay and a lot of reliability losses. Don't get me wrong, there are other methods that signals like this are passed between two hubs. I have seen really good integration between Philips Hue with their hub and other hubs or smart home platforms in your home. A lot of those signals pass locally, so it can be done direct between. The cloud services aren't involved in sending those commands. 
There are usually statuses still being sent up to cloud services, but that is more to keep track of what is happening in your home and to send those statuses to the other cloud connected services. There is another implication of having multiple hubs that rarely gets talked about and it can really frustrate you. If I take all of my Philips Hue lights and I integrate them into my smart home hub, and then I take that smart home hub and I integrate it with Amazon, Google, or Apple. Then I take my Philips Hue gear and I integrate it directly into Amazon, Google, or Apple as well. What happens in this case is I end up with duplicate devices in Amazon, Google, or Apple's app. Now there are some hubs that allow you to choose which devices will move up to that layer or be integrated with those voice assistants. But if you don't have that choice, then you have to decide whether or not you want to have duplicate devices or you want to not integrate those secondary hubs like Philips Hue directly with the voice assistant apps. Not integrating a service directly can have drawbacks and Philips Hue is a great example of that. See, today when I want to start a scene that I have created in the Philips Hue app, I can choose either a dynamic or a static scene. The dynamic ones change colors over time and this is a very commonly used feature. If I use the direct integration between Amazon and Philips Hue, I can choose either a dynamic or static scene to execute in my routines. Or actually just when I'm controlling the scenes in the Amazon app. However, when I run this integration through most other hubs, and then into Amazon, I lose that dynamic scene option. Unfortunately, there isn't a really good one size fits all answer to this, but there is good news on the horizon as the upcoming matter standard should make things a little more ubiquitous between your different hubs and your voice assistants. We also shouldn't see as many duplicates with matter ready products. The other option around this is to disable devices in the Amazon app or just live with the fact that when you say turn on X bulb that the voice assistant will come back and tell you that it's turning on two bulbs. In the section about multiple hubs that we just completed and in the section about organizing your smart home with a hub, I have made mention of some of the best practices. I will quickly summarize some of the biggest ones there and then give you a few more of the best practices with your smart home hubs. And then I'm going to tell you how to properly locate your smart home hub and how it fits into your home overall. In terms of a best practice for organizing your automations and how you control your home, go in this order. Modes, scenes, automations or routines, a dashboard, voice control, push buttons or switches, and then finally the app. Use the right technology for the situation. Here are some examples of that. Wi-Fi is best for high bandwidth situations like cameras, uh, speakers, and streaming sticks. Zigbee is great for low cost sensors like these ones, and for homes that have lighter building materials in them. There are a lot of hubs and devices available for Zigbee too, so there tends to be a lot of reasons to look at this technology from a market standpoint. Z-Wave has a lower carrier frequency than Zigbee and Wi-Fi, which means it works better in rooms like your furnace room, where there's a lot of metal and a lot of reflective surfaces. It's also better in homes with thicker construction materials and it can reach further than Zigbee or Wi-Fi. Bluetooth is interesting because it is high bandwidth like Wi-Fi is, but there's also a low power version called BLE that can be used with sensors and other battery powered devices. Proponents of Bluetooth say that even if your Wi-Fi is out, your phone can still communicate with your products, which is an interesting benefit. LoRa is easily the furthest reaching wireless technology that we'll talk about today as it boasts a quarter mile distance. This is what smart cities are being built on quite often and that tells you the level of reliability that you can expect from this communication method. There aren't a lot of options available for consumer electronics though. Thread is the newest technology on this list and again there aren't a lot of options available for products with Thread on it. Still, over time the options will grow and Thread holds benefits over Zigbee and Z-Wave in a lot of ways. It reaches as far as Z-Wave 
and it will be interfered with less than Zigbee. Plus, it has as much bandwidth as Zigbee, but it has lower latency or the time to respond when compared to Zigbee and Z-Wave, especially as your networks get larger. Nowadays, companies are figuring out how to combine these technologies to get the most out of their smart home hubs and the smart home networks that you're building at home too. One example of this is called Amazon Sidewalk. You'll hear uh, Amazon is putting Sidewalk on lots of their Echo speakers and in lots of the Ring products. Plus you will start to hear that other manufacturers will build Amazon Sidewalk connectivity into their products. Now here's the interesting thing about Sidewalk. It uses LoRa for long range communication. It uses Bluetooth for setting up the devices or when Wi-Fi is out in your home, it can use that too. And it uses Wi-Fi for general communication with your devices. So think of it as the top layer that takes the benefits of these technologies and combines it into one specification for you or a device manufacturer to know about. Now, a similar thing is happening in the industry with the creation of the Matter Standard. This new standard will use the benefits of Wi-Fi, thread, Bluetooth, and even ethernet connectivity and use them in different combinations. Some Matter devices will use thread and I think we will see an overwhelming number of those be sensors and smaller or less bandwidth intensive products. While other Matter devices will use Wi-Fi and or ethernet connectivity when they need that high bandwidth. I also think companies will decide to use Wi-Fi when they wanna make a cheaper version of a smart home product. But all of this and all of the discussion around these technologies and standards is to say that each one will have different benefits and your hub having access to as many of these as is possible is really beneficial. The next tip is for any smart home hub you have, it's important to keep track of the automations that you have kept in it. Some people find it okay to just look at the list of automations, but I think it makes more sense to keep either a large spreadsheet or a book where you, you have put automations and what they are impacting. No matter which hub you have, there will be a set of community boards and a set of content creators like myself who will create guides and keep you updated on what you can do with those devices. Grab yourself a few resources and don't be afraid to get involved in conversations about the hub you're interested in or using. And again, no matter what hub you have or are looking at, make sure that you have access to their support system and that they will actually respond. You'll want to ask a lot of questions around what other products can do within their hub, or you will have general questions about features in their app. One of the other things that's a best practice with hubs is locating them right. However, this is a bit of a complex topic that we need to drive in a little bit deeper on. I'm going to borrow a diagram I did for our previous video. It's best to start by talking about a modem that you normally get from your internet service provider and a router. Those form the basis of your network and you might get a mesh Wi-Fi system or a number of network switches to build out that network around your home. From there, you will attach a smart home hub, either through ethernet or by an ethernet cable. And of course, you can have multiple of these hubs and place them all over your home. However, there should be quite a bit of thought that goes into locating your smart home hubs. Most of them will physically fit anywhere due to their size and innocuous look. However, depending on the physical materials of your home, other sources of radiation or wireless signals, and the wireless technologies being used on the hub, you may only have a few places where you can put the hub and have it actually work right. Each wireless technology has a maximum distance that it can travel. These are stated publicly, and yet, when you see the distances in this chart here, understand that those calculations are done in open air and with no interference sources. There's no materials in your walls uh, being in the way, like is the case in your home. Now, the higher the carrier frequency of that technology, the more likely your wall or other materials will affect the distance and even completely interfere with signals. Here's a great way to think about these wireless signals. And this app just works with Wi-Fi at 2.4 gigahertz. 
but you can see how the wireless signals are being reflected and refracted by the different materials and surfaces in the space. In some cases, depending on the material, those wireless signals might even be absorbed entirely. Each smart home hub will have its own set of radios and in general today they are created as omnidirectional antennas. The good news with that is that once you're a few meters or at least a few feet away, the radio signal should be traveling out in a spherical manner. However, within that short area around your hub, interference sources could be really damaging to getting those signals out into your home and to your devices. When you place your Zigbee device or your hub next to a strong Wi-Fi source or a strong Wi-Fi signal, that can create interference. I use apps like this one called Wi-Fi Man on Android to find out the strength of my Wi-Fi near any of my devices if I'm running into issues. I only troubleshoot if things are breaking. Also, many of these other wireless standards have devices that can repeat or act as nodes in the mesh network. In Zigbee and Z-Wave networks, they'll be called repeaters. In thread networks, you'll hear the term border router or router. In Wi-Fi mesh networks, you call them mesh nodes. It's all really the same idea. Those mesh nodes, repeaters, or border routers can help you get around interference points or materials that don't allow strong, reliable connectivity to a device. However, your hub will not likely give you the tools necessary to change routing. These networks are what is called self-healing. So if something's not connected, the network will try to reconnect however it can. Also, if you remove a repeater, the network will eventually try to find a way around it. All this to say, the best practices for getting and maintaining connections to your hub connected devices is to make sure they're far away from interference sources and that they have strong signals nearby that allow them to stay connected. Now I should say that some hubs will give you utilities for either rebuilding a network like a Z-Wave network so that things are more efficiently organized. Or they might have diagnostic utilities that show you the routing that's going on and how often something is failing to be communicated with. But this isn't something consistent throughout hubs and should affect your decision in my opinion. I have spoken a number of times in today's video about matter. I've told you that a matter controller is really very similar to a smart home hub. And in fact, it's really just a new name for a hub. However, there are some minor differences between matter controllers and smart home hubs, and it will change how hubs are perceived and how they are managed in your home, at least in some small ways. I think the first and biggest change is that a matter controller is intended to allow you to switch very easily between it and other matter controllers. When you think about a smart home hub and you think about directly connecting a number of products to it, those tend to be difficult or at least time consuming to move to another hub. The idea with matter is that a feature called multi-admin allows you to move between the hubs very seamlessly. This would suggest that the problem of duplicating devices would disappear, but we aren't 100% sure on that as I make this video. The other big change is that Matter is really using a couple of those wireless technologies as well as Ethernet connectivity to accomplish its goals. That means when you have a Matter controller, it could contain some or all of the technologies that are included in the Matter standard. Now I've already said those technologies are Wi-Fi, Ethernet, Bluetooth, and Threat. Now Bluetooth is really just for getting the device set up initially because you'll be using your phone and that will make the initial connection between those two to transmit data back and forth during the setup process. From there it will be one or more of Wi-Fi, Ethernet, and Thread that will be used to communicate with the device. This means that again, you will have to pay attention to the radios on your hub or on your matter controller. If you don't have a matter controller with thread on it, then you wouldn't be able to connect any thread devices to your smart homes network. Now here's the thing with thread and Wi-Fi when we talk about products that are matter compatible. A device 
could have thread but not be matter compatible. And a device could be matter compatible but not have thread. A device could have Wi-Fi but not be matter compatible. And again, the reverse could be true. I think what you will see over time is that you will end up with many matter controllers in your home as they are being located on more device types than the traditional hub that we're familiar with. A great example of this or of that is that matter controllers will be located on a Samsung fridge in the near future. I suspect televisions, routers, and many other appliances will have them as well. And really, many electronics can get them now. And that is the biggest change when you combine that idea with the fact that the multi-admin feature will allow you to transition between apps and platforms relatively easily. You will have an easier time using the unique features of each platform with all of your smart home products. This is, of course, the goal, and we have to wait to see how manufacturers play within this kind of a system and how they try to create their own unique offerings that are better than their competitors. There is one additional big change between Thread and Zigbee and Z-Wave and because it's included in the Matter standard, this is a really important point to note. With the introduction of Thread 1.3, what has happened is that multiple border routers or multiple thread controllers will be able to work together in a single thread network, which means once you've paired your thread device to a thread network or a thread border router, then you won't have to worry about switching between thread controllers and different applications. Why I say this is such a big difference versus Zigbee and Z-Wave is because each of those requires you to unpair from the existing hub before using another controller or app or hub. Now let me be clear, I'm not going to complete an entire comparison of all these smart home hubs, but I will give you what I think are 15 of the best smart home hubs available today and what specific benefits and radios they bring to your home, plus some of the drawbacks you might experience. Let's start with a really simple one from a company called Flick. This hub connects to their Bluetooth smart buttons and connects to Ethernet to get on your home's network. The hub has an optional IR blaster, which means that you can use the buttons to fire out an IR signal at a non-smart electronic device in your home. The real power behind Flick is that the buttons connect to so many services now and so many platforms. They actually do that through the hub, but it's an expensive system when you get right down to it and it's really a great secondary hub that provides you push button control. Now all of their push buttons get three different styles of clicks and that connectivity to so many platforms plus the feature of being able to have a single click hit all of those platforms at the same time makes it a real aggregator of your smart home with the push of a button. This SwitchBot is a very unique maker of smart home products. They started out with their bot and just got more innovative from there. That means they have truly unique offerings and almost all of their products connect through Bluetooth to their hubs. Now, they do have some Wi-Fi connected products these days, but in order to get real automation features inside of their app, you will need the mini hub. You can have multiple mini hubs in your home to blanket your whole home with coverage because Bluetooth doesn't necessarily go far enough. And I can tell you from experience that having multiple hubs is both useful and doesn't cause you additional issues. Their automations are pretty good within their app and they even have options for things like NFC tags to start automation. The system continues to get built out with new products multiple times a year and the mini hub themselves act as one of the best IR blasters on the market today because of their ability to program any button from your remote into the hub. The drawbacks to SwitchBot are that most of their automations and connections to other products or other platforms run in the cloud. So while you can always open the app and connect to their devices through Bluetooth, your automations generally require the internet to work. The other drawback is a lack of a direct integration with Apple HomeKit right now. 
And when I look at Samsung SmartThings integration, I feel like that is fairly weak. But SwitchBot has great integration with Amazon and Google, plus some integration with Home Assistant. One of SwitchBot's biggest competitors is Akara. Akara has a number of different hubs that they sell and are actually really innovative too because their hubs are sometimes contained within cameras that they sell. Akara's hubs use Zigbee at the moment, but there are indications of upgrades to their hubs when the Matter Standard comes out. We are also starting to see versions of their products that use Thread, which will be a welcome upgrade over time. Plus a lot of their hubs have that IR blaster on it that can be custom as well. Their app and their overall platform work really well with Apple HomeKit and it becomes one of the most useful ways to automate your home if you want to use Apple's home automation system. The one thing that always impresses me about Akara is how their devices always have a few unique features to them within their app. A great example of this is on the new uh, E1 curtains, which have a mode that allows you to move them slowly over a period of time. They also have gesture support on some of their camera hubs, which means you can start a routine using your hand facing the camera. I actually debuted this smart home system on YouTube, or at least I think I did. And this system is the only one I know right now that has LoRa as its communication technology, at least for smart homes. It's hard to find around the world, and I don't even think it's licensed for the radio frequency for around the world. But if you can get Yolink products and their hub, then it has some really interesting properties. Because it's using LoRa, all of the components can communicate up to a quarter mile away from this hub. There are all kinds of unique devices on the system too. Plus, they have been really focused on home security and on leak detection and prevention. So they have real use cases in your home that go well beyond lighting, which they actually kind of struggle with. When you create automations, the app is okay, but they are fairly limited in their complexities and they also have to use a cloud connection in order to execute those automations today. The really interesting thing about this system is that if you just buy a couple of components, so let's say, a uh, leak sensor and one of their valve actuators, then you can pair those two directly together. You wouldn't have any app control unless you go get the hub, but pairing those two directly together means that when the leak sensor detects a leak, your home valve would automatically close. And that would happen with no required internet and actually no required hub. The other critique of this system is that because it uses LoRa and because there is no real plan to integrate that technology with the Matter standard, we could see this product sitting on the outside looking in. Or at best, the company figuring out how to make their hub a bridge to Matter networks. But no word on that yet. I said that Yolink struggled with lighting and that is where the next couple of hubs really succeed. Philips Hue is almost entirely light-based as a system, although they do have a set of motion sensors and a couple of things like smart plugs and wireless switches. The whole system is really built around lighting and it communicates through Zigbee to their hub or by Bluetooth to your phone. Now, this is a true secondary hub though today, and I say that because Philips Hue connects to almost every other platform and hub that we are talking about today. What's amazing about that connectivity is that in a lot of cases, it is done locally within your home. And that means the commands and automations running in other systems come across the Philips Hue and to your lighting almost immediately. The Hue Hub itself does have a limitation on how many devices can be connected to it. And so in some cases, you might end up running a few if you go really deep on the Hue system. There are some minor automations that you can execute on this hub, but in general, all you're going to do is create scenes and some time-based or location-based automations, and then run real in-depth automations on another hub. We could see this actually start to change with Matter, as Signify, the owners of Philips Hue, have come out and said that their hub will get a Matter update, and that might give this company the push it needed to start creating deeper automation options in their app. The other lighting-focused hub is Lutron. 
they have light switches as well as switches that work with your fan and because they are Lutron, they're really good at doing that electrically in your home. Now their hub uses 433 megahertz radio signals to communicate with the different components and they even have smart plugs that can dim a lamp in your home. Their switches and their controllers also allow you to control blinds and shades. So they're a true full home lighting solution, but they don't have a lot of those other types of smart home devices that you will want. So they end up being a secondary hub. Now their reliability is extremely high and I think that comes from the use of 433 megahertz RF to control their products because that isn't interfered with by much. Their app is reasonable, but I wouldn't call it mind-blowing, and as uh, yet I don't have any information on them creating matter compatibility within their hub. They wouldn't be able to make any of their end devices, so the switches, those couldn't be matter compatibility because of the frequency being used. But they could look at that hub, which does connect through Ethernet to your network. A really interesting offering is Atom's Homey, and I would say that this is the first true primary smart home hub that we're talking about in this list. What's interesting about Homey is that you can just download the app and connect five products to it and start to create what they call flows, which are really automations, but it's quite an interesting system to do so. After that, you can get Homey Bridge and or you can pay $4 a month to get more connections with Homey Premium. You can also go all the way up to Homey Pro, which has just about every radio and connection technology you would want, plus it does pretty much everything locally. The more I look at this system, the more I like the development and the different features that you have on it, plus the compatibility continues to expand. I think the big drawback is that you will probably end up in a subscription service with this hub and it also doesn't seem to have a thread radio, although they could spring that on us when matter is released. Another really serious primary smart home hub is by Homeseer. Now, I think this company has been around for about 20 years at this point, and they have a lot of home automation devices that you can buy and even connect to other systems. Even the basic hub from Homeseer is $150, and the pricing goes up from there. Plus, you will end up purchasing upgrades every few years for the software and or the firmware, and versus some of the other hubs that we're talking about today, there aren't as many integrations at least not free ones. And that's because many of the integrations or plugins that have been created will cost you money because they were built by a developer who was hoping to make money off that. That's not a bad thing because developers should be paid for their work, but it could catch you with this system. So it's just kind of high cost for me, but despite that, it's a really comprehensive home automation system that can do really in-depth automation and is highly reliable. The Google Assistant is the most capable voice assistant available today. And it comes on all of the Google Nest speakers and the Google Nest Hub smart displays. It also comes on many phones or at least the ones running Android and that provides you the voice control for your smart home. Google has a fairly good layout for their app and they integrate with almost every type of product you will want and every smart home hub that you will look at. The problem with Google is that they've never enabled their routines features to be started by other smart home products. They have stated that this will change when the Matter Standard comes out and they're actually ready from a physical hardware standpoint for this standard. That's because many of their speakers already have a thread border router on them. And actually, when you look at the origin of thread, it comes through the company Nest, which Google bought a long time ago. Unfortunately, until Google turns on all of these routine features that allow us to start automations with one or more triggers, then we won't know how to rank this as a smart home hub because right now it really isn't one and all it can do is start routines and run scenes by voice or at a scheduled time. Apple has a number of hubs in their ecosystem and when you look at the Apple HomePod mini it's a fairly capable hub when we talk about connecting thread and Wi-Fi products. However, in order to connect something to that hub it has to be certified to work with Apple Home 
and that extra certification has always meant less products are available to connect to the HomePod Mini, as well as the other hubs I'll tell you about. This actually means that most of your smart home costs more when you work in this way. And the only way around a lot of that is to get what's called a home bridge. There are a few on uh, the market today and I use the Starling Home Hub to get my Google Nest products into Apple HomeKit. There are also home bridges that you can make with a Raspberry Pi or you can buy something like Hoobs, which is a uh, commercial version of HomeBridge. This will give you more options to bring into Apple HomeKit that are low cost. Now, as far as I can tell, Apple is as ready as any company for the upcoming Matter standard, and its Apple TV 4K is another hub with both thread and Wi-Fi connectivity. The Home app by Apple is fairly capable, but the automation options that you have for starting routines is not really comprehensive, and you don't really have multiple conditions that you can use there either. So I would call this a mid-tier automation option, but if you have Apple iPhones in your home, which you'll have using Apple HomeKit, then Siri Shortcuts is an app that is available on your phone or your iPad and actually opens up a lot more options for in-depth automation within your phone and your home. Now, one thing that should be noted going forward is that some people were using an Apple iPad as a hub for their HomeKit system. And unfortunately, if you want to use that, the Matter standard, or use that with the Matter standard, the iPad's not going to be able to function as a hub. To be honest, I had tried the iPad before. It's a disaster anyway, so it doesn't really matter. It's a battery powered hub that can run out of batteries. Amazon sells a number of Echo speakers and Echo Show smart displays, and each one has a number of hubs on it. In most cases, you will find the cheaper speakers have just Wi Fi connectivity as well as Bluetooth. You might also find that they contain a sidewalk hub, which I explained included LoRa as well. Now, when you start to get to some of the bigger speakers and smart displays, then you get more hub radios. The Echo Show 10 and Echo Studio, as well as some older speakers, have a Zigbee hub on them. But the most capable hub at this time is this fourth generation Echo speaker. It has a Zigbee hub, a sidewalk hub, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and when the Matter standard is released, its Zigbee radio will be dual purposed to include thread. And yes, that can happen if a company is smart enough. That is a lot of connectivity on a $100 speaker. And although Amazon's automations never run locally, it is expected that this will start when the Matter standard is released. And I think that's going to be a common theme when we talk about all of these speakers from Google and Apple and Amazon, as this is one of the major aspects of that upcoming Matter standard. The idea is that connectivity is local inside of your home network, and that will mean as long as the processing power is available on your smart home hub, or in this case, a smart home speaker, then they should be able to run routines or automations on that device. For some time now, Amazon has been preparing the right level of processing power and has been putting that on many of their speakers, but I think the Echo fourth generation is the epitome of this. The other side of Amazon is Ring. Now Ring includes a true smart home hub with smart home security and they have a lineup of sensors, lights and cameras that connect. Plus their app connects to a few other brands too. I find that other than buying official Ring products, the integrations aren't as powerful as you'll see on other hubs. That statement applies mostly when we talk about Z-Wave devices, but the app is easy to navigate and because a lot of it is Z-Wave, a lot of it can happen on the hub. However, most of the products that you will use with Ring are camera-based products like doorbells and to get most security features and cloud recordings, you'll need a subscription. There is a lot of good synergy between Ring and Amazon when purchased together as Amazon Guard Plus works with Ring Professional Security Monitoring, and a lot of the subscription plans are being combined between Amazon and Ring now. So I love Ring for people who are really tied into Amazon, but it's not as comprehensive a smart home hub as some might hope. Still, that security feature is a big plus. A little while ago, I tried out a hub that you would call a Tuya hub. 
That means it integrates with what is called the Smart Life application. And there are a number of hubs out there that you can buy for that app. What I will tell you is that the hub I bought here has uh, Bluetooth and Zigbee radios, and it did a fairly good job of connecting to those devices that were both compatible with the Smart Life app and had those radios and certifications. The automation options were not really deep, and I will tell you that the app itself doesn't have really deep automation options, but this is a good middle ground for people who just wanna start out with something uh, relatively inexpensive. The biggest problem for me though was that I couldn't really integrate the products that sat on this hub or that connected with this hub with many other systems. I could get them into Google and Amazon for voice control, but nothing else so far. So this is pretty basic stuff, but again, so cheap that it's kind of fun to have. IKEA has been producing more and more smart home products, and although they're first hub didn't really hit the mark in terms of how well it worked and how many products it worked with, the growth of this platform is continuing and it's something that I'm a little excited about. The new hub coming this year will provide connectivity to all of the older Zigbee products from IKEA and that is on top of future Matter compatibility on that hub. Plus, they'll get a new app and many new devices still coming out. All of this means that IKEA is about to turn a corner and become a true smart home hub with some really inexpensive accessories. So while this isn't quite ready, it's something to continue to watch. Let's get a bit more serious and talk about what I will call the three most comprehensive hubs today, or at least the ones I'm gonna talk about. Now, Hubitat has had a number of versions of their hub come out. They connect to many Z-Wave and Zigbee devices and they have a full product compatibility list in case you want to have a look. There aren't a ton of products on that list and there aren't a ton of cloud connected devices because the point of Hubitat is that it does all of its automation locally. The rule engine that exists on Hubitat is actually remarkably easy to use in a really complicated way. Another feature of Hubitat is that it can use WebCore for scripting, which means you can create those really crazy automations. And Hubitat comes with its own safety monitor. That means you can get DIY home security done with this hub and some sensors and other devices. Plus, that rules engine really means you can automate a ton of things. There are a few gaps with this system, and I think the biggest gap is that the application is all pretty much run off a locally hosted website on the hub. The interface there is really rudimentary, and a lot of people have trouble understanding what they're doing there, but once you understand the interface, it's pretty easy. Another big gap for me is that we don't see any cameras connected to this system, so that has to be done separately somehow. However, people who use Hubitat love the depth of automations and the local nature of the hub. Sometimes users end up with a couple in their home to fully automate their life, but this is a great way to go. Now, Home Assistant is like Linux in a lot of ways. Everything you do is a little bit harder and you have to rely on the community to get some of the more advanced things done. Early in Linux days, you had to load it on a computer you already had, and today, Home Assistant is very similar. There are many options for grabbing the Home Assistant operating system and loading them onto different computing systems. Everything from Raspberry Pi boards with hard drives or flash memory, to Windows PCs, to NAS hardware. And nowadays, the Home Assistant team has managed to get out a few commercially available hub packages to buy. General automations, installation, and configuration aren't difficult things to do. It's not hard to integrate products from other makers into Home Assistant, and it's not hard to do most basic things. It's also the most flexible system we're talking about in this list today. And they were actually one of the first platforms to show us how Matter will work, so they're getting ready for the new standard. As much as is possible, your home will be locally controlled with Home Assistant meaning you shouldn't need the internet. Now that's said tongue in cheek because many integrations require the cloud because that's how many companies integrate with other platforms. So you need to buy right and pay attention to which products integrate locally to keep that benefit in your hub. Despite all these advantages, there are a few things to consider before you head down this path. The first being at any time you could run into a deep 
technical challenge and have to battle your way out. You need to be ready to spend a lot of time troubleshooting, scripting, or just generally figuring out the nuts and bolts of your smart home and how things truly work at a layer deeper than every other hub I'm talking about today. Also, if you wanna take your smart home control with you out of your home, you'll need the Nabu Casa subscription, which also enables Google Assistant, Amazon Voice Assistant, web hooks, and a lot of other cloud-based features that most people will want in the end. Now, the biggest thing I look at when I see Home Assistant is an open source project that's ripe for the picking by a company that wants to get a quick leg up in the game. That might work out for you if you're using the system, but it could also mean the end of all of that effort you put in if this system sells to a big company. Now, I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if that's going to happen, but it's something that I think could happen. Samsung purchased SmartThings a number of years ago, and they have tried to bring that system more and more into their whole suite of Samsung products. A few years ago, Samsung stopped making hardware for the SmartThings system, which had a lot of people worried about it. But they replaced their hardware by allowing other companies to really make the same gear, and they have started to expand in terms of the numbers of manufacturers that can connect to their platform. Plus, they have been on the forefront of the matter standard development. Their system or app is really easy to use and there's actually quite a bit of flexibility in it if you use all the features, automation, scenes, and even modes uh, because they're all something you can create in there. And you can also use sharp tools or action tiles to make those customized dashboards. And even with sharp tools, you can create rules with their system that act as automation. And SmartThings has a feature called Labs where SmartThings or Samsung is trying things out and you can try them out with them. Sometimes those features turn into full-fledged features and sometimes they don't work out well and go away. Now, Samsung leads in a couple of ways in my mind, and I really like their smart home monitor service, which is a true DIY option for smart home security. Uh, they have options for connecting a few security cameras, have a large number of integrated Samsung products, plus they have been building more options for life automation into their app. And the other big thing that's going to happen is their hub is going to end up on many more electronics that you bring into your home. If you buy anything Samsung in the next few years, it'll probably come with a SmartThings hub and you will be able to use their system. This is the system I use in my home and I love most things about it. However, the system comes with some drawbacks. The biggest of which is that Samsung has a few outages every year. And because they are not completely local, users can lose access to their system. Just last week, I wasn't able to access the app for most of a day, but most of my automation still ran. That's because Samsung has been working on this issue for a long time and have created a system within your hub called SmartThings Edge. Anything Edge runs or connects locally to the hub, so they are headed in the right direction. The other issue I've run into is that the app limits the number of devices and automations you can have, but You'll actually find that with most hubs, it's just that most people don't hit those limits. And there are a number of other hubs or smart home platforms that you can use. I just haven't used any of the other ones. So I'd love it if you guys uh, commented below about the system that you truly love and have found great use out of. That'll help everyone else watching this video. For now, Let's put this all together so you can go forward and begin to automate your life with hubs at the center of your smart home. A hub can be anything from a little white or black box to a camera with a hub inside to a smart speaker, or it can be something that is just contained on your phone as an app. The biggest differentiator you will find between hubs is what they can connect to and whether or not those connections are done locally or through a cloud service. The features for automations and those tacked on features like home security or the ability to connect to cameras or even full on app stores like Amazon Skill Store are important because they can forever extend the usefulness of your smart home. In the end, all of the hubs end up as an aggregator in your home and you can have multiple 
hubs, but you should plan to use them in layers with secondary hubs feeding information up to your primary hub. You should try to keep the uh, amount of hubs in your home relatively lower and you could experience duplication of devices in the larger voice assistant apps or even in your hubs if you manage this incorrectly. The good news is you can redo those integrations if you don't like it. Choosing your primary or even secondary hubs carefully is one of the most important decisions you can make in your smart home and it will drive a lot of the success or failures you will have. For now, I have a playlist that's up on screen of the best advice I can give you for your smart home. These are the videos that help you choose your hub or help you build a component of your smart home the right way. So check that playlist out if you are ready to continue on your journey. Otherwise, thanks for watching today. And of course, don't hate, automate.